I'm delighted to welcome uh, on your behalf your keynote for this afternoon. Um, and it's, it's a sort of added pleasure for me because um, Jan is a graduate of our doctoral program. Um, and so this is what can happen. <laughs> but it's a great, it's fantastic to be able to work uh, uh, alongside her and read her, her, her work and, and to see the way in which she's developed this incredibly interesting niche uh, uh, considerations associated with um, social justice, which actually has grown out of an interest in, in critical theory. Um, I found her think piece extremely interesting. And uh, for me, in particular, this attack on false dichotomies I thought was extremely helpful, particularly the bit um, which referred to the uh, uh, false distinction between quantitative and qualitative uh, methodologies. Well, they're not methodologies, methods. So uh, please welcome Jan MacArthur. Thank you very much, Murray, and thank you, everybody. So this keynote has got a slightly different focus. I'm going to be looking at what it means to be a close-up social justice researcher, and I'm going to do that largely through the perspective of critical theory. To begin, I want to just restate the quotation, if I may, that I began my think piece with, from Carl Sagan and his book, The Pale Blue Dot. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely dis distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. But Carl Sagan, in this work, he goes on looking at this notion of close and far, and actually talks with some wonderment about this pale blue dot, this pale blue dot that encompasses all the people who've ever lived, all the love affairs, all the play and all the tragedies and all the injustices and compare his sense of wonderment with here, just one last perspective on our pale blue dot. This from Arthur Schopenhauer. Countless luminous spheres in infinite space, around each of which whirl perhaps a dozen smaller illuminated spheres, inwardly molten, covered with a congealed cold crust on which a film of mold has produced living knowing beings. This is the empirical truth the real, the world. So from the pale blue dot to that thin congealed crust with a veil of mould. <laughs> Perspectives differ. What I want to do in today's talk is to continue just for a little bit playing with this notion of perspectives and the relationship to social justice. I then want to go far and go back to very early critical theory and to look at the notion of critical social research through the lens of the Frankfurt School. I want to come near again to the present, to third generation critical theory and the work of Axel Honneth and his notion of social justice as mutual recognition. Then I want to travel through assessment for a little while with critical theory as our navigator and see what it looks like. And then I want to end with some ideas to hold near as, as researchers we journey near and far. Some principles that I want to sort of set down um, in my talk. Social justice should never just be a topic of research. Social justice embraces the motivation, the means, the approach, and the focus of our research. Social justice must exist in our philosophies, relationships, and demeanor as we research. And perspective is a social justice issue. And I have two examples of perspective that I want to share with you. The first one is related to this painting 
I used a similar painting, this at Hecu many years ago, if anybody remembers it. It's from an English painter called John Glover, who, who was taught to paint in England, painting English trees. But he was one of the very first Europeans to go to Australia after the European occupation. So what he paints captures this moment of strangeness, because that doesn't actually exist anywhere. That is not how the Australian native landscape looks at all and yet evocative of a time in which two cultures were faced with extremely um, surreal, almost, experiences. I think it's quite powerful. But I'm using this image for a second reason, because there's a particular writer who first got me to understand perspective as a social justice issue, and it's this book here, the Other Side of the Frontier by an Indigenous Australian scholar, Henry Reynolds. And it was published in 1981. And this book literally changed history, not on its own, but there was a body of scholarship at this time. But this was one of the really important ones, because until this time, it hadn't been recognised that there had been a frontier in Australia. There had been a political war on Australian soil which went on for many years and in which many people, black and white, lost their lives. And so what Reynolds says, the Aboriginal response to invasion was much more positive, creative and complex than generations of white Australians have been taught to believe. This is 1981, remember. The heroes of nationalist mythology had their little-known black counterparts. Epic journeys of discovery were not the preserve of white men. The stoical endurance of pioneer women was matched by that of their black sisters. And he goes on. In parts of the continent, the Aboriginal death toll overshadows even that of the overseas wars of the 20th century. And at this point, it's really important to understand the strength of the Gallipoli and Anzac traditions to Australians' culture and sense of identity. How then do we deal with the Aboriginal dead? Why do Australians frequently say all that should be forgotten? But forgetfulness is a strange prescription coming from a community which has revered the fallen warrior and emblazoned the phrase, lest we forget, throughout the land. And as I said, Henry Reynolds changed history in two ways. He changed history looking back, that we understood that what had happened since the European occupation in Australia was very different. And he changed history going forward because with a different sense of what had happened, the Indigenous Australian movement was able to flourish in ways it hadn't at that time. And I'm not painting a rosy picture of Australia today necessarily, but things are better than they were in 1981 and much better than they were decades before that. But it's strange when you read this again today, it just makes me think of the whole Black Lives Matter and that these are still the issues we're confronting. Black Lives Matter, lest we forget. My second example is somewhat different. And if Sue may help me with the lights, I just want to show you a very short three minute video from the American TV show, The West Wing. I must thank Georgia, Sue, Alice, and Rebecca for making, helping make that work. I hope it was worth it. And just to bring it a little bit closer to home, any guesses why I would put up the good old BBC weather map? because of Scotland. It was an icon during the um, Scottish independence um, referendum. Scotland is an awful lot bigger than that, but so actually is the northwest of England. So anyway, but perspective matters and makes a difference. So I'm going to suggest that there are certain challenges for close-up social justice research. The first is the relationships between the fine-grained and that big picture. Second is where are the frontiers, where are the battles, where are the injustices, and where are we in relation to them? How do we navigate distance, strangeness, and time? And what do we mean by social justice? So I'm going to begin with, the criti with critical theory, but particularly the critical theory associated with what's become known as the Frankfurt School. And again, <coughs> I want to go near and far 
I want to go back to very first generation critical theorists, Horkheimer and Adorno, and then come forward to Axel Honneth. And just so he's not left out, second generation Jürgen Habermas is the tall chap in the background. So I've got the whole set. Um, the reason I find critical theory so useful for the work I do, thinking about social justice and education, is because of this rejection of false dichotomies, which I talked about in the think piece and had in Anne-Marie and Joe's um, session before lunch, a, a brilliant example of unpicking the qualitative quantitative dichotomy, other ones, the general, the individual, conceptual and the empirical. And what critical theory entreats us to do is to in a sense be in a constant movement between different dimensions and perspectives. I want to go back to um, a really interesting historical document, which was the inaugural address when Max Horkheimer took over as director of the Frankfurt School in 1931. And even though it had existed as an, as an organisation for some time prior to that, really the Frankfurt School that we know today came into existence under Horkheimer's leadership. And it's an interesting document because it sets out a vision of what social justice research should be. And I think, what, 85 years on, there's still some resonance in this and perhaps some things to help us think about our current practice. And I'll briefly also just quote a few other points from a 1937 essay of Horkheimer's, which was the first that actually explicitly outlined the concept of critical theory in comparison to traditional theory. So the first thought from Horkheimer. Critical theory maintains it need not be so and the necessary conditions for change <coughs> already exist. So we must look and understand the historical perspective to understand our society and the conditions for change. But more than that, as social justice researchers, we must believe that it need not be so, that habitual recurrent practices, tacit assumptions, these can be changed. And as researchers, we have to believe that they can be changed. The ultimate aim of philosophical investigation is the vicissitudes of human fate, the fate of humans not as mere individuals but as members of a community. We research the social world because we are members of that social world, but it is a world of fissures and divides and fractured frontiers. This is not a soft, <coughs> cuddly version of community. but it's not altogether negative either. <coughs> Critical theory is based on an interdisciplinary outlook. Philosophers, sociologists, economists, historians, and psychologists are brought together in permanent collaboration to revise and refine their questions in the course of their substantive work and develop new methods without losing sight of the larger context. So multiple research perspectives are provided for social justice research, and probably and no one of us can provide them all. What we need to do, <coughs> excuse me, is to avoid the distortions that come from very fixed perspectives, and to also beware of false barriers, the sort of epistemological assumptions, or what Trowler calls epistemological essentialism, that lead to us sort of othering other disciplines, which then stand in our way of being able to work with them for the common goal of social justice. <coughs> we have to have movement and flexibility in how we approach the research process, Horkheimer writes. Each of these methods alone is completely inadequate, but all of them together, in years of patient and extensive investigations, may be fruitful if we are successful in protecting the unified intention from the dogmatic, dogmatic rigidity and from sinking into empirical technical minutiae. This is what I was trying to talk about in the think piece, in the idea that sometimes I suspect, I, I, I 
I talk to researchers who get very caught up in ideas about they need to be using particular methods and things like that. And methodological consistency is important, but we have to be able to move with some flexibility between methods, depending on what we're trying to find out, because it's a complex social world that we're trying to understand. There are latent forms of domination. This is, an <coughs> this is a particularly important part of critical theory, and it comes from the interdisciplinary combination of Freudian psychoanalysis with Marxism. And looking back, <coughs> I'm sorry, I've got a tickle. Um, as, as Jay... No, I'm okay. Oh, fine, thanks. As Jay, as Jay says, it's hard to imagine now how audacious the unnatural marriage of Freud and Marx was for in, early, in early critical theory. But I think where it's important to understand it is because what it does is it gives us this movement between the close-up individual. Nothing can be more close-up than that looking into the, the hidden and the underlying distortions of human existence and looking at broader society. So that dialectic between the individual and the general comes there in this audacious and strange marriage of Marxism and Freudian psychoanalysis. And what it does is it entreats us to look behind, underneath, and beyond the surface and beyond the mainstream. This is this part of this constant motion of critical theory is to be looking beyond, behind, and underneath. And we need to be careful of feigning disinterest. It's just a weather map. It can't stand for anything. There's nothing going on there. I've included this slide because one of the things that I find really interesting when I read early critical theory, and it probably, it might be a generational thing, I don't know, but they often stop mid profound thought, to have some personal observation about someone who's died or someone who's unwell. And in this, Horkheimer is talking about his predecessor, Karl Gumberg, you know, the long illness, just, you know, one of those senseless facts of which individual life in the face of philosophical transfiguration comes to naught. And I've included that because it's important, I think, if you are a social justice researcher, to remember that people matter and people get hurt. And when I look back at something like the REF, I know people who got hurt by the approach to research that was being promoted there. Not in our department, one of the nice things, we sat down after the results and were talking about it and we actually said, you know, we're all, still, we're all still talking to each other and we're all still happy. No individual was sacrificed in the name of the ref, but that's not the way it always is. So I believe the personal is something that always we need to hold near as social justice researchers. <clears throat> social justice research has to span the social world. So here Heike Horkheim is saying social philosophy is thus above all concerned with phenomena that can only be understood in the context of human social life with the state, the law, the economy, religion, in short, the entire material and educational culture and intellectual culture of humanity. Education nor other spheres are never in isolation. And it's really hard to always remember that, particularly if we're doing close-up research but it's that importance of understanding the close up and the far away. And in addition, critical theory was against ever focusing on just one aspect, such as class alone. <clears throat> and I love this quote. This is about Adorno from um, Goer. It says, such was the immense range of topics that no place seemed to be protected from Adorno's pen. So he would go at once from some incredible philosophical treatise on Kant to then something about lonely hearts columns or the size of television sets. And you know, I think as close up social justice researchers, we should never be ashamed of where our interests might fall because it's, an, it's impossible to predict where those incredibly important insights are going to come from. 
and Jay talking about the Frankfurt School, a sometimes dazzling, sometimes bewildering juxtaposition of highly abstract statements with seemingly trivial observations. And maybe it just says something about me, but it's that juxtaposition of the everyday, the trivial, the gossipy stuff with this um, abstract theory that I find really um, inspiring. And to finish um, the last insight from Horkheimer's opening address, Zern describes critical theory in terms of interdisciplinary social research with emancipatory intent. So it is always about, on the one hand, looking back. We have to look back to understand the present, but it's always also about looking forward. And that emancipatory intent has to be there to drive us from within as we research. Thus, the idea of are we researching about social justice or are we researching for social justice, that dichotomy isn't consistent with a critical theory approach. And in his, in his essay, he writes, friction rather than harmony between the parts of the research endeavour is what we should aim for. We need to be careful when it's all looking just that little bit too neat. We need to start to be suspicious and wonder what, we, what, what, what should we be looking out for. Oops. I want to come back close. It's all right. Sorry, Mary, I don't need them. I want to come up close to the present day and Axel Honneth. And I think his contribution to critical theory, which doesn't give blind obedience to what came before him, but it is definitely rooted in the same traditions, the ideas that I've just been talking about. One of the criticisms commonly made is that critical theory is extremely good at critiquing what other people are doing and less good at offering um, a positive outlook of its own. And some people regard it as extremely pessimistic. Now, I don't, I don't quite read it that way myself, but I think there is some truth in that, looking at early critical theorists. And I think that's where Honneth is different, because what Honneth has tried to do is to offer an explicit conceptualization of social justice. And I want to stress here, because we've already had some different ways of doing this in the two keynotes already and in various of the presentations, I think the important thing is not whether one comes down and said, oh, yes, that's the conception of social justice we should all be using. But it is simply as researchers, if we are saying that our research is about social justice, we do need to have a reasonably complex understanding of what that is if we're really going to travel any distance along that path. And I like Honest because in the tr tradition of critical theory, it's neither absolutist nor relativist, and it fits nicely with what I talked about some years ago here at HECU, the idea that social justice research is necessarily complex and messy. Honneth offers a plural notion of social justice. So there are three aspects of mutual recognition, love, rights, and merit. And I'm going to explain what's meant by those in a minute. It's an intersubjective theory of social justice. So it's based in the nature of human relationships. And it's about this dual perspectives between self-realization and social inclusion. And it's, I can't stress enough how much it's important to understand that. He refers to this as the mutuality. Our capacity for individual realisation and social inclusion go together, as does the giving and receiving of mutual recognition. They go together. And this quote from Honneth, the justice or well-being of society is measured according to the degree of its ability to serve conditions of mutual recognition in which pers personal identity formation and hence individual self-realisation can proceed sufficiently well. And just to labour this point again, because when I talked about this at another place uh, some, a few weeks ago, um, I was surprised how much people misunderstood what I was trying to say about Honneth, and I think it's because of the nature of the language. And I want to say you will hear words like self-confidence and self-esteem. And I'm not talking about this sort of pop psychology, you know, you can do it sort of stuff. I'm not, nor is Honneth. 
<coughs> so if that seems to be the language, what I ask you to do is please keep in mind the whole time that there's this duality there of the individual and social inclusion going together. So it's not just about this sort of nonsense. I mean, we've all, we've all got a friend on Facebook who loves these sorts of things. <laughs> so you might be that friend. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Moving on. So mutual recognition. It's about giving and receiving. It's about self-realisation and social inclusion. And the reason I like it is because of this dual perspective. Sam, wherever Sam is, spoke yesterday <laughs> about Nancy Fraser. And of course, Nancy <coughs> Fraser and Axel Honneth have, had, have published this most fantastic book where the two of them debate each other's ideas on what they mean by mutual recognition, and particularly in relation to redistribution. And it's a, just, it's a gorgeous act of scholarship because it's such an open and robust and yet respectful debate. But Honneth, in a sense, is taking it back a step I would argue, from Fraser to this sense of the individual, but always with this duality with social inclusion. So let me just try and briefly explain what he means by these three different modes of recognition, and then I'll give you an example that might help to sort of bring them to life a little bit. OK, so love recognition exists in the realm of effective care. And we would demonstrate this in the notion of through emotional support. It plays to the part of personality with needs of, and emotions. And there's a level of intimacy and particularity here. So this mode of recognition is between particular people. It's between a particular man and his daughter, a particular woman and her partner, between two particular friends. So it has this level of particularity, which is very important. And the practical relation to self, to use Honest's words is one of self-confidence. This is about the capacity for confidence in oneself. So at an extreme end, mis an extreme form of misrecognition would be physical violence. Physical violence denying somebody recognition of who they are. Respect is about equal treatment in law. And so this is slightly different. This is more in the cognitive realm. And the dimension of the personality it relates to is moral responsibility. Because what Honneth emphasizes is that it is not about the fact that people have certain rights. What's important is that people have those rights, understand that they have those rights, and that they then exercise those rights. And it's, they, the mutual recognition can't exist without the actual exercising of the rights. And there's a universality to this compared to the previous one. This is, you know, we have a law or we have a rule and it applies to everybody under the, <coughs> in the sort of the cohort applicable. And this is about the capacity for res respecting oneself through being able to know, use, various rights that one holds. And the final dimension is merit. And this refers to the notion of social solidarity. So it's different again. It's what achievements are considered socially worthwhile. And so the mode of recognition is social esteem. And it refers to our traits and abilities. And again, there's a, a relationship here to the individual. What particular traits and abilities do I have that enable me to make a social contribution, to contribute to the solidarity of the social world, and how are they then recognised? So a capacity to hold one's achievements um, in esteem to receive merit. So how would we know we were moving towards social justice in Honneth's terms? Legal rights is fairly easy to understand in a general social way in terms of something such as marriage reforms. So marriage equality legislation would be seen as a movement towards greater social justice through recognition in law. In the dimension of love, and this is a quote from Honneth, the elimination of role cliches, stereotypes, and cultural attributions that structurally stand in the way of the possibility of mutual adaptation to the needs of others. So patriarchal family relationships and things like that, which deny um, the capacity for self-realization. And finally, merit. 
Connor says, radically questionizing, quest, quest, questioning? <laughs> well, it's a good word, actually. <laughs> radically questioning those cultural constructions which in industrial capitalism's past have catered for the distinction of only a small range of activities with the title of gainful employment. Thus, we would move towards greater social justice if we had a more comprehensive appreciation of the different traits and abilities and social contributions that people make. What I want to do now is take Honneth's critical theory and apply it to the example of assessment as a small demo, if you like, of how we could use this as social justice researchers. What sort of questions would arise if we had a perspective of mutual recognition of social justice? And I want to emphasize here again, I, I mean, I began, I began researching and thinking about this area when there were two different parts of my um, I suppose, research interests that, you know, sometimes after a while they just collide and you think, why didn't that ever happen before? So, you know, I was interested in the whole assessment for learning um, debate and the literature there, and I find it very persuasive, the idea that, a liter that assessment plays a key role in shaping what and how students learn. I was clearly also very interested in social justice, and it struck me one day, well then, we've not really thought about the role that assessment can play. If assessment is that important, it's been rather overlooked, probably because it's difficult and we perceive it as difficult to change. It's been rather overlooked in social justice literature. But the two questions, what would be involved in making assessment itself more socially just, and in what forms of assessment would contribute to social justice, I want to emphasize again that from a critical pers theory perspective, those two questions go hand in hand. You cannot meaningfully do one and not the other. <coughs> and I want to just share as a, as a first way of demonstrating the notion of social justice as mutual recognition and what misrecognition might mean. I want to share this quote from Edward Said. And he's talking about his senior schooling. My impression is that I was always frowned on for my character or absence of it, something of the sort. So although at the end of two years I graduated as a senior with the highest average in the school, I still wasn't named either salutatorian or valedictorian. When I, when I tried to inquire, I was told that I didn't meet the moral requirements and I've never forgiven that particular infringement on my achievement. That's what I mean by misrecognition and assessment. That's one example. To come back to somewhat more prosaic than Saeed's experiences, if we were to look at the, at the level of self-confidence, of love recognition, I think we need to look to the extent to which there's a lack of trust and honesty in our assessment practices. And I could give you many examples of this, but the one I would do to start off is something such as the plagiarism industry. And it's really, I'm talking particularly about those absolutely horrible big multinational firms such as Turnitin, which seek to instrumentally change the nature of our relationship with our students. Have I probably just said something slanderous, but there we go. Um, it's really interesting when you, when I've been looking at the literature on the use of these sort of plagiarism detection software, and what really worries me is that often when academics write about it, they write in a very technical, instrumental way about how it works. And when you do find students writing about it, which there's been a lot in the US, sadly there's not been so much here, a lot in the US, and when they write about it, they talk about what it feels like to have your first encounter with an academic to be one of a lack of trust. The first thing I'm going to tell you here in Social Justice 101 is we use plagiarism detection software. You will be penalised for academic misconduct and on and on and on it goes. Now, from a honest perspective, there's mis misrecognition there and that alters the whole, nation, whole nature of the student-teacher relationship. 
And the reason I've put it under love recognition is because I think there's a particularity there of the relationship. I think it's important, I'm probably now talking more with my hat on as a teacher, but I think as teachers committed to social justice, we have to see our relationships with our students as ones that are particular. We can't other our students by thinking of just that mass of people all demanding something of me. In terms of the realm of self-respect, um, here, it, again, this is the easier of the three dimensions to understand, I think. Here we're looking at ignorance of rights or the ability to exercise knowledge of the assessment process. And I think there's an awful lot of surface negotiation that goes on about assessment um, that does not allow students to actually fully know their rights and then to exercise those rights. Similarly, and this is perhaps expanding the notion of rights somewhat, but as academics marking, I think the research is really interesting to show that often academics are not in position to actually know everything that they should and shouldn't be doing and also to exercise it and to indeed shape, shape their own experiences, shape this realm. And the last one in terms of um, esteem recognition, I would say this is where we assess inappropriate forms of knowledge or we have practices that are inappropriate, assessment practices inappropriate to the knowledge we claim to be assessing, along with the privileging of economic value. And I'm afraid I'm not a big fan of the employability movement because I do think however it's dressed up, it ends up creating this sense that the traits and abilities that we say are valued in our students are of a narrow type. I don't think graduate attributes is much better, but it sounds a lot nicer. But I think we have the same sort of problem of, are we really dealing with the whole complex notion of the sorts of traits and abilities that are required to make a genuine contribution to society and to be recognised for that? And so <laughs> traditional, and I used to teach courses on assessment good practice and designing courses, and I would battle with our academics about why learning outcomes mattered. And I sort of, I don't know whether I'm poacher gone gamekeeper or gamekeeper gone poacher. But this would be a traditional view of how we should approach assessment. Um, the idea of smart outcomes might be familiar to many of you, I hope. The idea of constructive alignment, that what we learn, our learning outcomes, our methods, our assessments, that these should all be in harmony. And I've got nothing against these. But what I want to say is that as a social justice researcher, I'm interested in a different perspective. And this is the perspective that one gets, I would suggest, by taking a theory of social justice, a conception of social justice, such as Honneth's notion of mutual recognition and applying it to assessment. So we have mutual self-confidence, which is love recognition, through honest and trustworthy relationships. I'm interested in what sort of relationships we can have, and we have to ask very awkward questions here about these in an assessment context. Self-respect through genuine understanding of assessment policies and practices. Again, moving away from that surface negotiation, um, putting something in a handbook and ticking the box. And self-esteem through engagement with complex knowledge using genuine assess assessment tools. Sorry, I ended that a bit abruptly. My aim was, I hope it was clear, to say that the conception of social justice that I'm currently using to inform my work is this one, honest of mutual recognition. And I was hoping there to show the way that would channel through the sorts of questions we would ask if we applied it to, for example, assessment in higher education. But I want to conclude now um, going back to the theme of perspectives and social justice. And I've come up with some ideas that I think are social justice researchers that we need to hold near. And I've got these different questions. Why do we research? What do we research? How? What do we feel when we research? And what should we do with our research? So the first one, why we, why we research? 
I think Horkheimer said it rightly. We research because we are members of a community. And this quote from Jay, the role of the intellectual, the institute came to believe with growing certainty was to continue thinking what was becoming ever more unthinkable in the modern world. I think as a, if we're a social justice researchers, that is our role, to be thinking the unthinkable. And then again, as Horkheimer said, critical theory maintains it need not be so. I don't know about you, but the number of times when I talk about the possibilities for change and people can always come up with the reasons against it, and I'm not being naive here, but I'm saying that unless we believe that education can do some good, we've lost the debate before we even begin. What we research? Well, it needs to be both the conceptual and the empirical. Critical theory holds, we need a, a, a foothold in the social world and simultaneously point beyond it. That's from Nancy Fraser, again, another critical theorist. And as close-up researchers, we understand the troubled dichotomy of close and far. How we research. We research through this ongoing movement between near and far, an ongoing movement between the known and the unknown. It's never linear, it's always circular or elliptical or any other shape, but not a straight line. And we need to look to others as researchers and we might sometimes find the people that are gonna help us in our social justice research in unexpected places and doing unexpected things. What do we feel when we research? Does it make us happy? Now, I'm going to share a quote here from Kafka. The reason that the tenuous, well, it's not that tenuous. The connection is that this is in a book by Richter about Adorno, and he's using this quote to sort of demonstrate his view of sort of an Adornoian perspective on, on thought. So this is from Kafka, and it's about reading a book, but I think we can take reading a book to be what we do when we research. I think we ought to read nothing but books that bite and sting. If the book we are reading does not wake us up with the blow of a fist against the skull, then why are we reading that book? So that it will make us happy? No, we need books that affect us like a misfortune, that cause us a lot of pain. And I think good social justice research causes a lot of pain. And who said critical theory was pessimistic? I don't, just <laughs> nonsense. Right. But I think you understand the point I'm making there. We have to be really careful that we don't end up with a lovely harmonious outlook and call it our social justice perspective, because it can't be. And finally, what do we do with our research? Well, my answer is quite simple. We disrupt the world. Social justice research must be a lived act of social justice. Otherwise, it has all the vigour, legitimacy and authenticity of the simulacrum. And three final thoughts about critical theory. It entreats us to think about our relationships with other researchers. It compels us to move between perspectives. And it demands that we research, that our research be in conversation with the world as it is and as it might be. That's all. Well, thank you very much indeed, Jan. Uh, uh, what I really love about Jan's work is this sort of, and I called it earlier, I said, do you mind if I say this? It's sort of a visceral connection between uh, values of equity and fairness and a really sophisticated kind of rendition of the critical theory and it's a fantastic integration and very inspiring so thank you very much Jan now we have 10 minutes or so for questions if I can read my watch <laughs> so open to the floor yes Sam. Yes. Um, so I'm going to push you a little bit more on that phrase a little bit because I had a <laughs> brilliant presentation and I absolutely have had to ask the questions and sound a bit material and economic, but I think there's a wonderful space for Alexander's work in some of the more effective domains of research things like care and <laughs> education before and talk about that. But what I find difficult with Honneth, which is why I've kind of been drawn towards Nancy Fraser, is that there is a material
material, economic inequality and some of these social justice debates, and particularly I think we can deconstruct some of the rest of the story of the West Wing episode, I think there, where they flip the map around. Um, you'd see those coming through and how, for me, while Hamid brings a way of approaching some of the more effective dimensions of social injustice, I feel that it doesn't talk to some of the material and economic ones that, that need to be addressed at the same time. I was just wondering how you felt about that and how you differentiated the two. Um, it's a really good question, and I, I did have a slide about Nancy Fraser in which, for time, I had to, I had to get rid of. Um, for those of you who don't know, in this debate, I was talking about Fraser's argument, to put it quite simply, is that by focusing on mutual recognition, Honus leaves, runs the risk that the economic dimension, redistribution, doesn't get properly accounted for. Is that a fair sort of rendering of it? Honneth's counter-argument is that, that the economic and the cultural are important, but they're phenomenologically secondary to going back to that level of mutual recognition. And I find it quite compelling. And, and he, what he would argue is that what Fraser does is privileges groups that are already visible in society. So you can look to certain groups that are making certain cases in terms of you know, cultural deprivation or economic deprivation. But his concern is that underneath that, there can be many hidden forms of misrecognition that get missed. So, my, and I actually use Nancy Fraser a lot too, and I do like her work very much. I like Honest going that one step back that, that earlier perspective, of, to give it another word. And I think probably I was unfair. I could have, I could have done another, a rendering of him bringing out the economic dimensions much more than I did. Um, I meant to in the sort of, when I was critiquing things like employability and graduate attributes, narrow economic versions of what counts as useful. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a fair point. Maybe you and I can write the next book the follow-up to Honneth and Fraser. It can be Dent and MacArthur. There we go. As long as we get to quote the Westwick. <laughs> Any others? Yes. Um, I, I'm Tyler from Canada. I was just wondering about the academics who are teaching now are often those who have been pri privileged by traditional forms of assessment. So they've done well with exams, with essays. And they tend to do that for their own students. And some of them do that because they think, I did it, they should do it too. Yeah. But then others think it, it was beneficial because they've come out the other side. But I often find a lot of times staff project themselves into the student mindset and they don't ask the students yeah. their perspective. But they can just say, oh, if I were a student, I would think this would benefit them because of this. But then they're, they're not, uh, not showing that love and respect. And, because they're privileging a certain kind of knowledge and assessment. Absolutely. So well, taking it from a honest perspective, then, you know, that's definitely a case of misrecognition because it's not allowing the opportunity for them to fully develop and exercise their traits and abilities that might be socially useful. But I suppose you'd also go back and think those academics who went through very traditional forms, um, we have to rethink, well, were, were they the best things? They might think, well, I did well out of it because I got A's or something. But did they actually have the chance in terms of personal realisation to develop the most socially useful um, appreciation of their discipline? And I would say that probably not. It's very hard to say that to them. Um, <laughs> I did try at my old institution. <laughs> um, but I think that would be the sort of perspective I would take there. But it's a good point. OK, we've still got a, a bit of time. Yes, Paul? Um, thanks, Jan. Thanks, Jan. That's beautiful. Um, the thing I struggle with, and in a way this conversation we've had before around critical theory, critical pedagogy, is how individualistic it can seem to me. And there's something about the way that things are presented that seem to me very inside out, that we have this structured mind and we project onto the world rather than actually the world creates our mind structures and we're all indicated. And, and in the way that Edward Said account of how he should have got this, you know, yeah, 
it was injustice, but also that level of individualism. And something around the Honest thing, to me, seems very much about individuals rather than about collectivities. Now, knowing you, I don't think that's the case, but could you help me through trying to understand the ways in which it's collective? Sorry, easy question. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, well, it would be historical if we had an Ashwin easy question. So, <laughs> um, I see it as being about the collective because it's all about mutual recognition. So it can never be, this isn't something that can ever happen in a vacuum. It's all about social relationships. And it's about that interplay, that moving between the close and the far, the interplay between what is required for personal um, self-actualization of, you know, it's hard to avoid this sort of pop psychology terms, between that and the general, and that the two are, are just completely intertwined. It could be that perhaps I haven't explained that other side, and I think you're right though. I mean, the idea that it can seem to be just about the particular, but I suppose the counter argument to that I would make is that I think an awful lot of social theory has looked at the collective level. And I think I'm finding Honus really um, rich for my own work because I think he is forcing to go down to a different level that we sometimes find uncomfortable for all sorts of reasons. Um, but it's certainly not about one or the other. Can I just, uh, I think it is an interesting question, isn't it? Because uh, it's to do with privileging agency. Uh, it's another way of looking at it. Um, so that it, it, you might see it as an antidotal in the, you know, your point that, that you made last uh, about um, the privileging of structure, say, in, in say, Marxist theory. Um, so, I mean, do you think that was in the minds of critical theorists to act as a, I don't know, balance or antidotal perspective. You know, don't forget the agentic uh, dimension of how you want to connect with the world. And it doesn't deny structural uh, dimensions. I, I, think that's, I think that's a fair point, that, that certainly the idea of saying there is more than just structure in terms of how early theorists mm. responded to, to Marxism was to bring it in. I... My reading of Honus would be to say that it is very much, it has a lot in common with, you know, sort of a Giddens even, in terms of that this is about structure and agency, that what we're talking about. So, so it's, not, it's not privileging agency to the exclusion of structure. No, I did, I, 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 I got that. I, I, it was really just, it's a, it's a way of, you know, sort of building on Paul's point. Yeah. That when you, yeah. if you come to it fresh, without a lot of uh, background, and you think, well, you know, I can rule the world, sort of uh, message. No, it's yeah, all, yeah. It's all in my, it's all in my mind, no, it's all in it's my not. heart, it's all in my energy. Do you know what I mean? No, you, yeah, you but couldn't... it's, but it's not no, because I, if I, you're I in a, if you're in a structure, structural situation in which. Um, there is no recognition of that, then, then it, it amounts to nothing. So you know, so there's in a sense, there's never purely personal achievement in this framework. Um, that's what I was trying to say. It's not. It's not about the you know. No, no, you did get that ring I mean, of yeah. confidence, sure. sort of. You know, you the can next do manual. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we've got time for one more question before you break for some refreshment. Any others? Oh, a cup of tea back. Right. Okay. Jan, thanks once again. That was great. <laughs>